Good morning. morning. It's good to see each of you out at the Lord's house this morning. I want to say an early happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Obviously, this is uh, Thanksgiving week, and I I know everybody has a lot of activities and things planned, but let's pause together today and just uh, thank the Lord for so many things that He has blessed us with. You know, just within these last couple of weeks, we celebrated Veterans Day, and we remember, we're reminded of Uh, Being able to be thankful to live in a land in which we can worship the Lord and we can do the things that we do with freedom. And just as that song, Brother John, just sang, we have even so much more than that to be thankful for. Because not only can we have the physical freedom that this country offers us, we can have the spiritual freedom, the eternal freedom of being able to know that we've been broken from those bonds of sin through our Lord Jesus Christ and for his death on the cross. If you're able to this morning, I invite you to stand with us at this time. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I want to just ask his blessing upon our service this morning. And also, after we're done in the time of prayer, if you would remain standing, Brother Matt's can come and lead us in a congregational hymn. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, again, we just come to you today so thankful, so thankful for who you are, O oh God. And that you loved us in spite of us. Thankful for your grace and your mercy that you bestowed upon us. And Lord, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to gather here. We know around this world in which we live, there's many peoples that aren't able to, to collectively gather for a time of corporate worship. And we're thankful for that. Lord, we pray that as we honor you, that we worship you today, that your Holy Spirit might move amongst our midst, that, Lord, you might reveal to us that which we need to see. And, dear, dear Lord, we just ask that right now you're, you might prick hearts. And, dear Lord, that you might point out any faults or anything that we need to set right with you, that we might do that before it's too late. Again, Lord, we thank you for who you are. We pray that you just bless our time together, direct our thoughts, direct our words. Lord, that you just might be honored and glorified in everything we do. We ask this and pray it in Christ's name. Amen. I mean, glad to be here this morning. I mean, he's thankful to be here this morning. Like Andy said, I'm thankful we got a place to come and and worship this morning, and we're going to sing a little bit about that, 545 in your brown hymn, 545, count your blessings, we'll do the first, second, and last stanzas. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Are you ever burdened with a love? heavy you are called to bear. Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God Count your many blessings. 
If you have your Bibles, you can be turning with us to the book of Matthew, book of Matthew chapter 7. Uh, this morning, you might have came expecting a Thanksgiving message, and honestly, you're probably going to walk away thinking we got the opposite of that uh, this morning. But but last week, this week, and the following week, we're uh, going to be looking through the end of this uh, time where Jesus is standing up on top of the mountain delivering one of the most powerful, the most powerful message of all time. We, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, it's a series of, of kind of many messages that are recorded in the Gospels and, and also some lessons that he teaches and, and some things to take notice of. And, and as we've looked at this little kind of what I call a mini-series, we're looking at the thought of, of there's no middle ground. Last week, we looked at the, the difference between the, the broad road and the narrow road, the broad gate and the, the narrow gate. And, and the fact of the matter is that there is no middle ground. We're going to have one of two eternal destinations. And, and this week, as we continue into this passage of Scripture, we're going to be picking up reading at verse 15 here in a few moments. We're going to be looking at the problem. There's, there's a, some problems that come along the way that Jesus gives warning of. He foresaw this in the future. Uh, they dealt with it in Jesus' day, in the apostles' day after Jesus' death. And it's still things that we deal with today. And Jesus wants us to be very aware of the situation. And, and, and this may not be a traditional kind of Sunday morning message, but it is important that we look at it because it's often overlooked and, and, and minimized in our church world today. And as you got your Bibles there, we're going to look at this thought of false prophets and false teachers and, and see what Jesus has to say about it. So if you got your Bibles there, Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to begin reading at verse 15, and we're going to pause at verse 20, and we'll pick back up and, and hit a few more verses a little later. Matthew seven fifteen says this, Beware of false prophets. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. And thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. So, first of all, we're going to pause here. And, and we're really only going to look at two specific points in the passage today that we're going to be overseeing. And, and the first part that he wants us to take note of is the deception. This deception that we need to be aware of. It. He tells us that we need to be so aware of the first word that it says there. In verse 14 or verse 15, he says, Beware. It's one of those flashing caution signs. Most of the time in this, in this world, we, we're driving down the road and, and we're probably going about our business and trying to pay attention. But if you're like me, a lot of times we have a million things running through our minds. And if I'm not singing a song with the radio or, or engaged in an audio book that I'm listening to, I'm thinking of about a thousand things all at once and wondering how I'm going to get this accomplished or that accomplished or worried about this or worried about that. But, but when you're driving down the road and, and all of a sudden you see blue lights or flashing red lights, what does it do? It gets your attention immediately. It's there to grab your attention. That's why uh, emergency vehicles have them. That's why sometimes on signs with a sharp curve it'll have a flashing light. It's something to get our attention to say, Look out, look what's coming ahead so you don't become part of the catastrophe. That, that's what Jesus is doing here to the people that are following him, to all these people that have been out following him, that's gathered around listening to this message. They've heard all kinds of good things, all kinds of great things, a few hard things that they've had to listen to. But Jesus pauses in the midst of all of this sermon and he says, beware. He throws up the flashing light. He says, I want you to pay attention to this. This is something that I need for you not to miss. Because there's people with deceptive motives. He tells them to be cautious because of the physical presence 
of false prophets. He, when he talks about them, he, he talks about two things about them specifically there. He says their outward appearance, that they're going to look like sheep. They're going to look like sheep. Now, again, we, we live in a different day and age, but we still get the mental image of what Jesus is saying. We wouldn't walk up to a sheep and be afraid. Sheep's not going to reach out and bite us. It's going to look all soft and cuddly. I have uh, been at, at some friend's house that had sheep and had to feed them for them when they were gone. You didn't have to fear anything going out with the sheep. The, the only thing they might do is they might cuddle up really close to you when you got that bag of food. They might be really excited about it. He says, they look like sheep outwardly, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves their outward appearance is innocent and non-threatening but inward appearance it, it literally means that that passage there means they're extortioners that they want to take advantage of you we might reach down with a handful of food and feed a sheep out of our hands but if a wolf comes around we're not going to do it even a even a mildly aggressive dog we're not going to hold a piece of steak we're going to throw it out there for him right we we value our limbs we're we're going to be cautious about it and Jesus is saying you need to be aware because there's going to be people that are out to deceive you they want to trick you they want to fool you and, and whenever he does he tells us that, that we need to notice these these characteristics of them he tells them to look at their fruits. You're going to know them by their fruits, by their works or the results of their works. Now, I, I read an article this past week, and, and I have seen some people verify it, and some people say it's not true, but at least it makes logical sense. Apparently, there was a study done several years back in China that artificial sweeteners, the stuff that we, I'm like, I, I have a drink up here, and it doesn't have any sugar in it. It's got aspartame or saccharin or one of those artificial sweeteners in it. Unfortunately, that's something I, I like them. Well, they did a study on it years ago, and, and it was supposedly proven that with saccharin or aspartame or some of these artificial sweeteners, you could actually kill ants with it. And, and whenever I first read that, I was like, Oh man, I, I like that stuff a lot. I'm drinking that stuff, and, and, and maybe I need to maybe I need to read a little bit more into this. But but what what I actually read about it, the more that I, I studied on it, was it wasn't poison when they consumed it. But whenever they would set out large quantities of this artificial sweetener, the ants would come to it and they would take it back to their colonies and they would store it up and and they would consume it and eat on it. And what eventually happened to the colonies of ants, the study said, is that they all died of starvation. See, the artificial sweeteners didn't have any real nutrients in it. It didn't have anything of substance in it. That they would consume it and consume it because it tastes good, it looked good, it, everything appeared like it was great, but it didn't provide them the energy that they needed to sustain life. See, what Jesus is talking about here he says, these people, they're like those artificial sweeteners. They look really good, but their, their works are empty. They're hollow. And in the end, it can lead to death. It, it can lead to destruction. He says we need to be careful to evaluate. He uses this analogy of the good tree and the bad tree, or a good tree and an evil tree. And he says you need to, to notice what they're producing. He talks about that, and, and, and really what he's saying is you need to look at the desires of their heart, and specifically two ways in which we still see it to this day. We see people teaching false things, people taking advantage of people in the name of Christ. One is, is for financial benefit, for uh, deceptive motives. I mean, look, I could go through and name off all kinds of names, and I don't think that's really appropriate. But y'all have seen these charlatans on television that try to sell you some spring water or get you to buy a handkerchief or all this stuff and talk about how it's blessed and you'll be blessed. Just send us a donation, send us some money, and we'll give you this. And, and listen, there's people today. And I watch these infomercials, basically is what they are. And whenever I'm watching them, I think to myself, how can somebody that's a believer actually 
give to that? How can they support that? But I'll tell you how it happens. is because there's a lot of people that's very shallow in their faith, and they're just looking for a miracle from Jesus instead of looking for a relationship with Jesus. He says you got to be wary of those people that are producing bad fruit. So a lot of times they'll do it for, for financial benefit because they have uh, deceptive motives. The other thing that we think of quite often, these are the things that we can look and we can see and kind of point out if we really are careful, is for people that have bad doctrines. Over the years, we've seen all kinds of bad doctrines move across Christianity. And look, we see people with mega churches filled with people that are okay hearing half truths or partial truths or distorted truths. There's preachers today that'll tell you, well, now I won't preach on sin. And I think to myself, how can somebody see the need for a savior without acknowledging that they're a sinner? It's bad doctrine. There's, there's preachers, literally there's preachers that will tell you they will not preach on hell. Some, one real famous one several years ago, just finally rejected the concept of hell. And I think, man, what Bible have you been reading out of? I mean, the, the two verses of Scripture we looked at the week before, Jesus is pretty plain and he's pretty clear. And these bad doctrines, people will do it a lot of times because... They want to to have the fame and the success. They want people to like them. I have never been overly concerned whether people like me or not a lot of times. Some of you probably picked up on that up to this point. But, But really, even deep down inside, we want to be liked. We like to be liked. Here, the Jesus is warning you. There's people that just to be popular will say things. We, he talks about that, that they're going to tickle people's ears in other passages of Scripture. And, and, and that's what a bad tree will produce, those kinds of fruits. Whereas a good tree will focus on things like the salvation of souls, the building of the kingdom of, of, of God and developing disciples along this journey. Sometimes it's really easy to get confused because, why? Those bad fruits may look good on the outside, but what's on the inside is rotten. See, he says there, we need, he says, therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. He he tells us there's going to be a judgment for all those. Those bad trees are going to be cast into a fire. But he, he, he tells us in this passage, we need to be careful Because we really are responsible to be fruit inspectors ourselves. I'm going to be really, really straight with you folks. If you go down a path of following somebody that's that's leading you in a path of the wrong direction, they'll be accountable for it, but you can't use that as an excuse. Ultimately, you're accountable for your own salvation. You're accountable for your own soul. You're accountable for the decisions you make. The Lord gives you the free will whether to choose him or not or to choose to go down another path. And he also gives us the ability to learn about him and to grow in him and to develop a relationship with him. And as long as we are content with a shallow faith, we're giving ourselves an opportunity to be deceived. He says we have to be fruit inspectors. One of the things I had to do growing up, whenever I was in high school, all four years I was in high school, I was in FFA, and I enjoyed doing a lot of the things with that. I even majored in agriculture whenever I went to college and, and really enjoyed that side of it. One of the things in FFA that we did every year, our, our annual fundraiser was a fruit sale. I mean, it's still things they do today. And I can always remember on those fruit sale days, it was our responsibility. They'd, they'd get over the intercom and say, listen, if you're, if you're in FFA, go to the ag room, go to the shop, the fruit trucks are here. All the teachers let all the kids that were in ag out unless they had a test or something crazy going on. Because back in the day, whenever we sold fruit, we sold fruit. And when that truck rolled up, it was a job. And we started unloading just cases and cases, and we would go and we would stack them, apples over here and oranges here, and grapefruits over here. I don't want anybody to eat a grapefruit when you can choose from an apple and an orange. There's some people that did. But that we had all these different stacks of boxes, right? And we got them all unloaded from the truck so that the truck could leave. 
And Mr. Schartzer, one of the first things he did for all those that was, it was in his class, everybody else would go back to their class after everything was unloaded. For all those that were in his class, one of the first things he did every year. All right, time to start going through the boxes, especially the citrus stuff. And literally, we would take those boxes, and we'd take the lid off, and we'd flip it upside down, and we would go through and grab every piece of fruit. And we'd go through, and we would grab. We would literally, he didn't want us to look at it, put our hands on it. Because he, he taught us a lesson at, at a young age. If there's one rotten piece of fruit in the box, it's going to affect the whole box. And, and so we would go through, and we would pick through every one of them, and we would stack them and sort them, and then close it back up and do this, hundreds of boxes, and it was a monotonous process. But undoubtedly, throughout the course of doing that, every once in a while, there would be a box with a rotten piece of fruit in it. And if you had a rotten one, you need to look at the one beside of it because the next one might start getting a little mold or a little soft spot on it. And sometimes you couldn't even tell the difference because sometimes they would look good, but when you grab it, it'd be squishy. It wouldn't be right. He, tell, he taught us that we how, to, how to inspect fruit from an early age, and I've always remembered that. And spiritually, Jesus is telling us we have to pay attention. And how do we do it? We have to do it by researching it, by putting our hands on it. Don't just assume that what comes out of somebody's mouth is the truth. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's right. Now, if I say it, you know, <laughs> no, I'm serious. Go back and check. Back stuff up by Scripture. And even much more people that you really don't know and that you're not sure of, do it. Because guess who's accountable for what you believe? You are. Now, again, I'm going to be held accountable. The scripture's pretty plain. I'm going to be held accountable for every word that proceeds out of my mouth. And that's something that anybody that stands behind a pulpit or stands holding the word of God should take really seriously. But we're all accountable for what we take in and what we consume. He says we got to be fruit inspectors. The first thing he says is we got to be careful. Watch for the deception. The second thing in this passage, the second point he tells us about is this declaration. Notice the declaration. Verses 21 through 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, the, the second half of this, he gives this declaration. He makes this pretty bold statement. And several, actually a few statements here that we're going to, to look at. The first thing he, he tells us is we have to understand, again, misconception. He says some pretty harsh words. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I want you to hear this today, folks. We must do more than profess and confess. A relationship with the Lord is more than a momentary decision or the words that come out of your mouth. It's more than getting dunked in a tub of water. It's more than that. Some people think that that's what it's all about. And, and, and those are the first steps in a relationship with the Lord. But the Lord makes it really clear that if, if just because you've called out to Him as Lord does not mean that you are right in a relationship with Him. We use the term saved all the time. It doesn't mean that you're saved just because you've called out to the Lord. And you might say, well, I don't, I don't know. That's not really what I've always heard. But, but catch what He's saying. He says, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. See, our salvation's shown, ultimately, it's lived out by our actions, not by a reaction. Did you catch what I'm saying here? Now listen, I'm not saying that works can save us, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, well, you can be a good enough person to get to heaven. You can do enough good Christian deeds to get to heaven. That's not at all what I'm saying. Those things go hand in hand. Profession, confession, and then abiding all go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You can't leave part of it out. 
That's not how faith works. And he says there's going to be people that are going to say, well, you know what, I, I, I prayed a prayer or I, I, I called out your name or I joined a church or I was baptized or I did these things. What do you mean I can't get in? He's going to say, what's it ultimately say? I never knew you. He tells us here we need to be really clear on what direction we're following, on what we're, what we're doing. And, and, and notice here, there's, there's several declarations that people will make and, and the Lord still has issue with. The first one, it says, there's people that will say, Lord, Lord. There's a lot of people, hear me, listen. There's a lot of people who call Jesus Lord, but they've never made him Lord. There's a big difference. There's a big difference in calling Jesus Lord and making him Lord. Now, I mean, I'll be the first to tell you. If, if Julie and I are at the house and we may disagree on something and she tries to tell me a different way to do it, my first instinct is to get defensive and be like, hold on, I think I got this. I've learned over time that even if I think that, I probably ought not say that. Right? It's the same way in our, in our, in our spiritual journey. Uh, there's times where we think we've got it, but the Lord's trying to direct us, and He's trying to tell us what to do. And if He's truly Lord, that means He's in control. And that's when we have to be submissive and say, you know what, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. There's a lot of things that I like things I would want church to be, but it's not about that. There's a lot of things in my, in my Christian life that I would like to do or that I would want to do, but it's not about that. There's a big difference in calling, calling Him Lord and making Him Lord. People are going to say, I called out Lord, Lord. I sang all the hymns. I, I knew the prayers. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. There's going to be those that will even say, listen to this. There's going to be people that says, I prophesied in your name. Now, again, we think of the word prophesy a lot of times, and we think it means tell in the future, but that's not at all what it really means. It's talking about that they proclaimed the name, that they preached or that they taught, and they even used the name of Jesus. But you know what they never did? They never submitted to the word themselves. Hard to believe there's going to be preachers and teachers that die and go to hell. Why? Because Jesus never knew them. They talked about them. Then the next thing gets even more confusing sometimes. It says there's going to be those that will say, well, we cast out demons in your name. We did these great spiritual works. And, and, and how, I mean, we saw people's lives change. There will be people that will help people to have life change. God will uh, use it or he'll allow it. But still, they aren't right because the Spirit isn't living in them. It isn't directing their actions. One, one, of, the, one of the real serious talks I have with, with young pastors, new pastors, and I have this with almost every one of them that I've mentored over the years or, or sat down and talked with, is listen, you better take this serious. This isn't something to take lightly. Because you can get up and preach and you can do a, a youth service or a revival or whatever. And unfortunately, this is reality. There are people that if they get saved under your preaching, that they are going to forever tie their spiritual relationship with God to you in some form or fashion. It's just human nature. We do that. It's not right, but we do it. And I, I tell them, I say, listen, if you go out and you start preaching and stuff, the next thing you know, you're out living in the world, you're going to be partly responsible for that soul because you've misled them. I mean, y'all know, y'all know preachers and teachers and people that's been like that, that they were faithful and they did what they were supposed to. and They may have been powerful. They may have been great evangelists or whatever. And now you look, I can name off name after name after name of preachers that I've known that don't even go to church anymore. And that's concerning. He says you need to be careful because there could be even people that do things. That, they, that, that people make spiritual decisions because of them. He says they've cast out demons. 
But he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. So we start saying, how in the world? We, we talked about, we can pick out fruit sometimes. This is getting tougher. Well, it's still even going to get tougher because the final thing is, it says, does many wonders in your name. We can go on mission trips. We can preach. We can teach. We can take up offering. We can sing in a choir. We can be a deacon or a trustee or a Wednesday night teacher. We can do all those things and him not know us. So how are we supposed to evaluate that fruit? I'll be really clear with you. We can't see inside somebody's heart. We, we can't always know. But, but I, I, will, I will give you this analogy that might, might help you a little bit. Again, talking about growing up and growing up on a farm and, and all those things. Jesus here, he, he talks about a lot of things and a lot of times he, he relates even back to agricultural things like the fruits earlier. But, but also that of a shepherd or, or a farmer in today's day and age. I, I, we, by the time I was growing up, we, we didn't have livestock anymore. But I, I've been around a lot of people and, and worked on farms that had cattle or, like I said, sheep or different things. And, and you can tell the difference. And, and there's basically two types of farmers. There's two types of shepherds, even in Jesus' day. There's, there's some people that can, can look at it as an investment, and, and it's a money-making venture. And, and listen, even in farming, you, you have to run numbers and, and make money at it, or it's not going to be profitable, and I understand that. I'm a, I, I, I do that for a living. I run numbers, it seems like, all the time. I, I understand that. But if I've got a farmer on one side of the fence has his herd of cattle or sheep or whatever, and they can get by scraping by with feeding them the poorest quality feed. And, and, and when they need medical attention, only send the vet out if it's profitable. And if it's not, just let it ride. Then we sell it off, sell off the animals, and, and make the most amount of money possible. Then on the other side of the fence, you see the farmer or the shepherd that, that looks out at the animals as a responsibility. And, and, and while it might be partly their livelihood, they also have compassion and they care. They, they, they have to understand that it has to make logical sense. And sometimes it doesn't make logical sense to, to do some things. But they also, they don't want to see their animals suffer. They want to see them healthy. And ultimately, they know in the end they're going to produce a better product, even though they may, may not profit quite as much. That's a good way to evaluate what Jesus is talking about here. We can't always see deep down in somebody's heart, and it's hard to evaluate their actions. They're both farmers. They're both shepherds. But deep down, what's driving them? What's driving them to do what they do? It's really easy for me to, to get focused on money here. In just a, in, in a, you know, a couple weeks, we're going to have to sit down and do all the budget stuff with the church. We've already got meetings scheduled with the deacons, and I look at all that. But I, I'm going to tell you, folks, and I'm not perfect in this, and sometimes I fail in this, but what I try to drive every decision I make is not about what I want. And it, I'll be honest with you, it's not about what you want. I don't really care. It's about what's going to reach people for Jesus Christ and make disciples of the people that's already here. That's what, that's what drives me. It's for the health and the well-being of the farm. What God's entrusted me with. And again, I fail and I fall short and I make mistakes. I'm not trying to act like I'm some beacon of perfection. That's not at all the case. But that's what you need to look at. And if you see people along this life and along this journey that aren't doing that. If they're doing things for the wrong motives, you need to be concerned and you need to protect the other people, your children and grandchildren and those that you put under, that the Lord's put under your care. But it first starts with you protecting yourself and knowing yourself the difference between what's right and what's wrong. I've reflected on it numerous times. But I, I want to reiterate it because of the importance. He tells us in this declaration. See, he says all these things that the people are going to declare to him. But it tells us really clear too. It says, and then I will declare to them. 
The Lord makes his own declaration. He says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Listen to me today, folks. You might say, well, I'm not one of those bad people. I'm not intentionally trying to mislead people. Maybe today, even in the midst of the message, you've realized, you, you know what, you, you might have done the spiritual things, you might have done the outward things, but maybe you haven't done the internal things. You, you might have for years called Jesus Lord. You might sing the songs, you might throw money in the offering plate. Shoot, you might serve on a volunteer or ministry team, you might sing in the choir. I don't know. But you've got a heart condition. Today, the great physician wants to help you with that. Today, Jesus wants to make a change in your life that only he can make. It's nothing that I can do, nothing here that anybody can provide you. But I, I'm certain of this. Jesus' desire is not to tell anyone to depart from me. I never knew you. That's not his heart's desire. It was so much not his desire, that's why he sent Jesus out of heaven to this earth to die in our place. But today, if you haven't truly accepted and received him as your Lord and Savior and made the decision that you were going to live your life for him, today that's the future that's in front of us. There's, there's no middle ground here, folks. It's one or the other. Either we're for him or we're against him. There is no middle ground. As we rise to our feet, as Brother Matt leads us in this song of invitation today, maybe you need to come, maybe you need to pray, maybe the Lord's burdening you with something. We encourage you, invite you to come today as we sing. Again, thank you for being here today and hope that the Lord has spoke to you as always. If, if you have need to talk, if you if you got uh, something that you need to pray about, maybe questions about what you've heard today. I encourage you to come and, and to see me after service or, or grab somebody else, one of the people that's out back, and just tell them you need to talk to somebody, and they'll point you to the right person. Again, thank you for being here. May God bless you this week.